So third installment of our look at Paralandra, and uh, I, it occurred to me I have not got very far in the book at all, and I just wanted to sort of touch on, I'm going to dip in at the story at various points. I've already looked at the main themes of interest to me, um, but I have noted at myself a few places where uh, the t some important things jump out and I just wanted to comment on them. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go from spot to spot and make comment on this. Um, first one's on page 62, at least in my edition, and that is uh, chapter 5, a few pages in. And uh, there's a commentary on, and I, I think I might have talked a little bit about that. Remember that the lady was talking about, or he was talking about his experience of Malkandra and the beings therein, and then she responded to him as if she knew all about it. And he asked her how, he, how she knew about it, and the answer was, Mal Eldil is telling me, uh, which introduced another dimension to the story that uh, we have not yet experienced. But this is an unfallen uh, rational being, what, what Lewis calls a now in the in Malakandra. And he asks her um, why the, uh, so she says, I see the big furry creatures and the white giants. What is it you call them? The Sorns and the Blue Rivers. Oh, oh, what a strong pleasure it would be to see them with my outward eyes, to touch them, and the stronger because there are no more of that kind to come. It is only in the ancient worlds they linger yet. Why? said Ransom in a whisper, looking up at her. You must know that better than I, she said, for was it not in your own world that all this happened? All what? I thought that it would be you who would tell me about it, said the woman, now in her turn, bewildered, what are you talking about? I, I think I did mention this, that in your world, Maleldil first took himself this form, the form of your race and mine. And then he's shocked. You know that? Yes, of course she knows that. And then she, he answers, but how do you know that those other races or creatures linger only in the ancient worlds? And then she responds with the comment that he's given her several times, are you so young? She answered, how could they come again since our beloved became a man? How could reason in any world take on another form? So that phrase, how could reason take on any other form? Now this becomes of substance here. This is not an a uh, casual comment. She's talking about human nature here and the definition of human uh, human being, which is uh, in the medieval conception an, an individual substance of a rational nature. So this is the definition of human nature that we have the capacity for reason. And we also on, nonetheless are individual and of, uh, and of substance. We have an individual substance. It's not a corporate quality, but it's, uh, there's an individual, and yet it's of a rational nature. So we have this capacity, and it distinguishes us from the animals. And in that, we bear the imago dei as well. So there's something about that, and, and it's not uh, irrelevant to the discussion here because we're about to meet in the person of Weston, a scientist who is going to try to move on from his enlightenment rationalism and embrace something a little bit more spiritual. And he will do so, however, at the expense of his reason, his reasoning capacity. I'll talk about that in a second and where Lewis is getting this idea from, but it is a comment uh, or that the, uh, the narrative is a response to another movement in his, amongst his contemporaries, um, aside from that of just scientism. Um, but I did read that already, but I wanted to uh, reiterate that emphasis on reason because that is an essential quality of human nature. And when I say that, there are many uh, Christians these days that deny that, say it's a product of the Enlightenment, Enlightenment rationalism, and we can embrace a, a notion of human nature, nature that dispenses with reason as definitive of human nature. This is deeply problematic. 
Uh, and not only that, if you, it, it breaks with the church Catholic because if you look at the definitions uh, of the two natures of Christ in the ecumenical councils, it will talk about that Jesus was fully God and fully man. And when it says fully man, it means that he had the capacity for reason. That's the definition. So if he did not have that capacity, he's not fully human at all. And so it's not just a, a small problem, it is a huge problem. And again, I note with dismay the anti-rationalistic uh, emphasis in churches, as if the Enlightenment came up with our notion of rationality. I've already talked about my problem with Enlightenment rationalism. It's sort of uh, the way in which it makes uh, rationalizing a part of our thinking and therefore our being. This is this is, but this is not reason across the board. It's not, it's not uh, Aristotle's notion of reason. It's not Augustine's notion or the ecumenical councils, it's not Aquinas's, it's none of them. You can't dispense with reason and solve the problem posed by the Enlightenment. That <laughs> You're throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Anyway, just I wanted to underline that right at the beginning. So she goes on to that and then the, she comes up with an eschatological explanation actually on page 63 um, that uh, and ran because Ransom in response to this with dismay that henceforth all rational beings will be men. You say it as if you were sorry. I think I have no more understanding than a beast. I do not know well what I am saying, but I love the furry people who I met in Malacandra, that old world. Are they to be swept away? Are they only rubbish in the deep heaven? Are they, I don't know what rubbish means, she answers, nor what you are saying. You do not mean they are worse because they come early in the history and do not come again. They are their own part of the history and not another. We are on this side of the wave and they are on the far side. All is new. And I, I think I mentioned that at the end of the book of Revelation, Jesus says, behold, I'm making all things new. What he does not mean by that is that uh, from an evolutionary perspective that what is older is obsolete and rubbish. And I think this is the response from Ransom here. He's still operating in accordance with an evolutionary mode of thinking, whereby uh, the thing that is the newest is the highest, rather like it's, it's an evolutionary perspective rather than a devolutionary one. So note, he's not expressing Lewis's point of view. He's expressing a man of our age who is uh, be, having his perspective changed. We're, we're experiencing the transformation. There is a cosmic battle going on on Paralandra. There is also a slow conversion of worldview in the person of Ransom, which the reader also partakes in. Okay? So again, just because the narrator and Ransom, he's the hero, that doesn't mean that Lewis agrees with everything Ransom is saying, let alone that it represents Lewis's view. Lewis himself is needing to be brought along. So he's also a fictional uh, narrator. It's Lewis, it's not really Lewis when he mentions himself at the beginning, right? So it's again, it's a part of the process bringing the reader along to see things a little bit differently. And the lady's nature is then described on uh, page 64. There was no category in the terrestrial mind that would fit her. One way of putting it would be to say that neither our sacred nor our profane art could make her portrait. Beautiful, naked, shameless, young, she was obviously a goddess, but then the face, the face so calm that it escaped insipidity by the very concentration of its mildness. The face that was like the sudden coldness and stillness of a church when we enter it from a hot street. That made her a Madonna. The alert inner silence which looked out from those eyes overawed him. Yet at any moment she might laugh like a child or run like Artemis or dance like a maenad. All this against the golden sky which looked as if it were only an arm's length above her head. The beasts raced forward to greet her and as they rushed through the feathery vegetation they startled from it masses of the frogs so that it looked as if huge drops of vividly covered dew were being tossed in the air. 
So there's something in here. And f finally, he says, there was in her face an authority in her caresses, a condescension, which by taking seriously the inferiority of her adorers made them somehow less inferior. Raise them from the status of pets to that of slaves. So interesting. So remember, the, uh, in the temptation in Milton's Paradise Lost, this is the claim. And he reiterate, reiterates scripture, you'll become as gods knowing good and evil. Satan claims that he has been transformed from a beast crawling on his belly to standing up and speaking. And you, by dint of application, since you are already speaking, standing on your feet, you will become divinized in the process. And of course, the opposite happens. They, they fall. And uh, I, I said the, the uh, movement towards equality in general in the human sciences, which want to put us on par with the animals, in Lewis's viewpoint, never lift the pets up or the animals. They simply diminish human beings and make them uh, subject to all sorts of experiments. And even we can kill them without any moral prohibition, because they're just another form of life, just like any other. We cut down weeds, don't we? Then why not cut down a million people? What's the difference? And there is none by that point. But here, the lady with her authority and her condescension, and the words very self-consciously spoken here, she is like, in the sense that Christ condescends to become a man. Though he was by very nature, God made himself nothing, taking on the form of a serpent, servant, etc. right? And, and that condescension the lady is also showing, and by condescending, she is lifting the animals up. So there's how you lift the animals up. And so again, Lewis speaking against this. And, and, and Ransom comments, the beasts in your world seem almost rational, and she says we make them older every day. And this is the cultural mandate in practice then. She's making what is good better. So the cultivation is not just in agriculture, more fruitful. It's also in the field of uh, animal, what we used to call animal husbandry. I don't know what we call it anymore. But you're, you're taming them. You're making them more uh, what they already are in a latent form. You're bringing that potential out of them. You're actualizing it. They're not, they're not going to be brought to speak, I don't think. But, but they are, in some sense, becoming domesticated, humanized. And, and fit for the Garden of Eden, which they are. So it, very interesting. And she, Ransom clung to her use of the word we. That is what I've come to speak to you about, he said. Malel has sent me to your people for some purpose. Do you know what it is? She stood for a moment, almost like one listening, and then answered, no. Then you must take me to your home and show me to your people. People, I don't know what you're saying. Your kindred, the others of your kind, do you mean the king? Yes, if you have a king. And she can't do that because she doesn't know where he is, etc. Okay. And I've already talked about this already. She announces that she is the queen and suddenly realizes that he's just one of his race and not the king of his race. And at that point, she condescends to him. Not, so she's not speaking down to him. She is treating him with greater courtesy. She's lifting him up. She realizes that she's speaking to an inferior, socially speaking. How does she do? Does she demean him? Does she say that you are lower on the social evolutionary scale? No, on the contrary. She speaks to him with grace and condescension and, and lifts him up by addressing him as uh, per his station. So again, note the difference. And this is part of the transposition that I talked about as characteristic of Lewis's uh, fictional endeavor here. It goes down to the point of personal interactions. We're going to see it displayed throughout. And again, he is speaking against the tendency of evolution to do the exact opposite, to reduce everything to the lowest common denominator and base motives. The reason I speak nicely to a girl is because I have desires for her, which are illicit or whatever. The reason I do this is selfish motivation. It's to save my own life, propagate my genes, whatever. There's never a good motive for anything, ever. You hold the door not out of courtesy, you do it for some advantage, manipulation, whatever. Uh, and if that's the motive, then everything is demeaned, right? 
deeply problematic. If that's the case, hospitality can never be shown or always be questioned, always be uh, ascribed an, uh, an ulterior motive which is self-centered and which renders the person who's been given hospitality uh, the great disservice of not being able to receive hospitality as a, an act of goodwill. Disgraceful. Goes against Christian charity, goes against the ancient world's understanding of how hospitality is. You treat the visitor as if they might be a god, right? You might be entertaining a god unknown, so show them hospitality. So Lewis is speaking against the way in which the modern sensibility of e the evolutionary sensibility speaks against our very human nature and ancient teaching, Christian or not. So let me move on from there. Um, we find that she is able to do what, whatever she wants, uh, lines at page 70, and she says, uh, there is no object that she wills which is not good. Everything she wills is good. That's also interesting. She can do literally whatever she wants in this world. She does not have a fallen nature. Every choice she makes is good. She will do it for a right reason. She doesn't choose things arbitrarily, but the world is a good world, and it's been created for her. It's, it's pleasurable. We've already talked about ransom eating the fruit and the experience that that was. He said wars would be fought over this fruit. It's, it was so delightful. Um, but... Um, but the temptation is about to begin. And one thing that is also interesting here is that there can be different laws in different worlds, she, is, she says. And, and there's some surprise at this because in Ransom's world, you can go stay on a fixed island if you want. whip de doo But she can't. So there's He's going to promote what Lewis calls the Tao in the abolition of man. We'll see that soon. But on the other hand, there are some prohibitions which are only are unique and for each particular world. And in our world, it was not to eat of the forbidden fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In this world, it's not the same one. It's not to dwell in the fixed island. Well, this world is marked by constant change. Right? The, the islands are not fixed. They go with the waves. They move around. Everything comes to her like a wave and everything is good, despite that change. Not so in our world. So there's a difference there. It's interesting. Uh, at that point in this chapter, Weston's spaceship la lands. Uh, the lady remarks something's fallen out of deep heaven. And um, uh, we can see further illustrations of the domestication taking place. So she's making, taming the beasts. They delight in her, she delights in them, and she is improving them. It's part of her task, if you will. And again, that points us to Genesis 1, 28, 29. Be fruitful, multiply, fill, and subdue the earth. It's not a charter for domination, that's the enlightenment. Exploitation, that's the enlightenment. R describes all reality around us as something that we are to gain power over and exploit. This is the dominion mandate. It's there to make it better, not to be serve our purposes in a selfish fashion and all for the glory of God. Right? And everything will be subject to that in that fashion. Um, interesting point on 80. Uh, couple points. First one, oh, that's 82, uh, is that he, when he was climbing, he cuts his knee. And she comments um, on, she said, it says she was inquisitive about the blood. And when he had explained the phenomenon to her as well as he could, wanted to scrape a little skin off her own knee to see if the same would happen. This led him to try to explain to her what was meant by pain, which only made her more anxious to try the experiment. But at the last moment, Mal Eldil apparently told her not to. Don't harm yourself. So there, it's not prohibited, but it, it, it's unwise. Mal Eldil speaks to her directly, don't do that. It's not prohibited, she could do it, she's directed not to, she listens. We're going to come back to the blood because later on he's going to have a cut in his ankle 
uh, is Achilles that won't go away, and the blood's called Hru. I'm going to say it right now because I might, I might run out of time later on. And she says, "Is this this? Is it, so this is Hru. Is this the substance wherewith the whole, wherewith the worlds were remade? The redemption that comes from the blood of the man. Is this the substance that f is in Ransom's heel? Well, and we'll we'll come to that. But I wanted to get that in in case I don't get to it later, just because I don't have enough time. Anyway, she's very interested in the blood, but Note that Malel doesn't want to talk to her about blood and so forth. So much a part of the Old Testament in relation to righteousness and, uh, and life. Remember the blood of Cain crying out uh, to God, uh, or the blood of Abel rather, crying out to God from the ground. Uh, also then associated with, with the cleansing of, of sin, sacrifices, etc. Um, at any rate, um, Ransom becomes aware of that it is Weston and also what the purpose is. 82. So that, he thought, was, is why I've been sent here. He failed on Malacandra, and now he's coming here. And it's up to me to do something about it. So finally, he knows he's been sent for a purpose. Weston lands. Aha. That's the purpose. So it's a, a straight battle of good and evil, if you will sent by the Eldila. But, little puzzle here, I've seen, he, he's thinking about how will I get support for this? If, he's, if he has supernatural evil pushing him, where are my, where's my help? I've seen no Eldila in your world, Ransom said. Eldila? She repeated as if it were a new name to her. Yes! Uh, no, it's Elidila said Ransom, the great and ancient servants of Maleldil, the creatures that neither breed nor breathe, whose bodies are made of light, whom we can hardly see, who ought to be obeyed. She paused for a moment and then spoke sweetly and gently, this time Maleldil makes me older. He shows me all the natures of these blessed creatures, but there is no obeying them now, not in this world. That is all the old order, piebald. The far side of the wave that has rolled past us and will not come again. The very ancient world to which you journeyed was put under the El Dila. In your own world also they ruled once, but not since our beloved became a man. So no longer. It's not just because we are in the silent world. We have no Archon. We also have no Elda because the, the, since God became man, no longer are these entities to be seen. In your world, they linger still, but in our world, which is the first of the worlds to wake after the great change, they have no power. There is nothing now between us and him. They have grown less, and we have increased. And now, Maleldil puts it into my mind that, there is, that this is their glory and their joy. They received us, us, things of the low worlds who breed and breathe, as weak and small beasts whom they, their lightest touch could destroy, and their glory was to cherish us and make us older till we were older than they, till they could fall at our feet. And I'm speaking about angels. Right? Their glory was to be, though they were higher, to become lower, make us wiser, and then to reverence us in the same way that we worship God. That is their glory. So again, note the different way, like we don't, we never think of the purpose of our lives is to become lesser. But again, that's the pattern of God himself. Likewise here of the Eldila. Again, contrasting with the evolutionary way of, uh, of conduct, all self-advantageous, etc. Here you become less. However I teach the beast, they will never be better than I, but it is a joy beyond all. Not that it is better joy than ours, but every joy is beyond all others. The free, fruit we are eating is always the best fruit of all. So, just interesting comment. And he introduces the idea that there is in fact a bad Eldula. And that's, that is interesting, and he, br he brings it up right here because of course Ransom is about to meet Weston, and he's worried about precisely that. You need to recognize that not all Eldila, oh, let me tell you, not all of them are good. But then he can't get to the explanation because Weston comes up, and he comes up with a gun.
what you don't understand, 84, said Ransom, this man, he is a friend of that elder of whom I told you, one of those who cling to the wrong good. So that's interesting. Just let me say one word about that. He does not think that Weston is in his nature is evil. He, he's not because he has an Augustinian notion of what evil means. And what is that? That is the Augustinian notion. The Augustinian notion of evil is that evil does not exist unto itself. It's the privation of the good. It's a, it's a lack of goodness. So there's some, he clings to a good. And what is the good? Well, it was already mentioned in Malachandra, actually, that he wants to advance knowledge and seek the uh, good of his own species. And so there's something good in him. And in fact, Oyarsa says exactly that. If I had enough time, he says, I could train this creature. Whereas the other one, <laughs> uh, divine, there's nothing good in him. I'll, I mean, if he were my creature, I'd just unmake him. Oh, bang, that's the end of him. Because all he wants, he's like mammon. He just wants the gold. He doesn't care about anything else. It's like, there's nothing good here. <laughs> Gone, right? Other than he loves gold and gold's shiny and okay, but n not really. Whereas the other creature wants the good of his kind, so it's a good outside of himself, above himself. I can do something with that. However, he does not recognize uh, the goodness of God and so forth. So he, uh, Ransom rightly says that this, this being clings to the wrong good. And that's the Augustinian explanation of evil, uh, is the tr choice of a lesser good ahead of a greater good. That's what Adam and Eve do when they fall. They disobey God and they choose the good of the fruit, whatever that they perceive to be, ahead of obeying God, which is the, the better of the two. And as a result, they bring sin and death into the world and all our woe with loss of Eden, etc. quoting Milton. And her response to this is, he clings to the wrong good, then I must explain it to him, said the lady, because she's in domestication mode. <laughs> well, then I'll just teach him, and then it'll be fine. Let us go and make him older, and down they go. And Weston sees him, and uh, Ransom says to him, right in seven, in the face of a revolver, are you going to begin in this world also by murdering one of its inhabitants? What are you saying? said the lady, pausing and looking back at the two men with a puzzled, tranquil face. Stay where you are, Ransom, said the professor. That native can go where she likes. The sooner the better. Ransom was about to implore her to make good her escape when he realized that no imploring was needed. He had irrationally supposed that she would understand the situation, but apparently she saw nothing more than two strangers talking about something which she did not at the moment understand, that and her own necessity of leaving the fixed land at once. She's in a place she's not supposed to be. She realized she's got to get out of there. She is about to, to scram. And then uh, Weston accuses Ransom of lascivious uh, intentions towards the green lady. I mean, you really expect me to believe that you're living here with a woman under these conditions in a state of sexless innocence? Ransom replies, I am asking you nothing but to begin and end as soon as possible whatever butcheries and robberies you've come to do. And then he puts the revolver away and then they start a conversation. And at that point, we, we meet the new Weston. Now, when I say the new Weston, it's the same guy, the same man. There's no difference. What has differed is his worldview has changed. And what we are going to meet is a variation on a uh, philosopher by the name of Henri Bergson. Uh, Bergson, a uh, French philosopher, uh, very influential in both analytic and continental philosophy in the early 20th century, won a Nobel Prize for Literature, by the way. Uh, when was that? Uh, I've got it in my notes here. Uh, 1927. Writes a, his most influential book is called Creative Evolution. And he posits the idea that there is a life force in 
uh, the natural order. So he disputes the materialistic reductionist view of nature of the Enlightenment. And for this, he gets a lot of criticism from the French Academy. They're totally secular. They, they don't like that he is, he's putting a spirituality into the realm of biology. He calls it creative evolution, writes the book, very influential. And this is the view that influences Weston. So when we hear Weston speak, we're not gonna meet Victor Frankenstein, which we did in the first novel, right? The, the Enlightenment scientist uh, committed to the good of his race, but willing to kill everyone else. We're going to meet a spiritualized version of the scientist uh, representing Bergson's views. Uh, Lewis is to some degree approving, by the way, because he thinks that there is a natural, a uh, spiritual uh, nature to all of God's created order. What he is not going to agree with is that all spirits are from God or of God. And so there's where the battleground is going to look. What do you mean by spiritual? What exactly? And because here, this is an even larger threat. And what he effectively presents, I will uh, point you to the uh, Mere Christianity, book two, chapter one, he will talk about um, different views, different theological views. And he talks about atheism briefly and dismisses it, so it's not even worthy of engaging with it. It's just not intellectually serious. He says the more serious one is the one we find in our midst, in our midst uh, called pantheism. And pantheism sees good and evil as a matter of perspective. Two sides of the same coin. What one person calls good, another person might call evil, and it just depends on the situation. But there is no absolute good, there is no absolute evil. There, and, and the speaking of it in such terms is a sort of a, a habit we need to get over. And so we get 50 shades of gray, more or less, in everything. Like there's no black and white, it's all gray scale. And, and morality and all these things go with it. Now Lewis attributes this to the German philosopher Hegel. I would, I would also say the Romantics. And he also mentions Hinduism. And this is the great danger is that all, pantheism means that God is everything. Everything's God. That is the view that Bergson uh, espouses more or less. He's in close enough to the pantheist school. And, uh, and that's also what our scientist Weston will now present to him as his view. He's, he's learned from his experience. And, um, and, and he admits a serious mistake. What was the serious mistake? Well, um, the tragedy of my life, page 89, and indeed of the modern intellectual world in general, is the rigid specialization of knowledge entailed by the growing complexity of what is known. It is my own share in that tragedy that an early devotion to physics has prevented me from paying any proper attention to biology until I reached the 50s. To do myself justice, I should make it clear that the false humanist idea of, ideal of knowledge as an end in itself never appealed to me. I always wanted to know in order to achieve utility. At first, that utility naturally appeared to me in a personal form. I wanted scholarships and income, and that generally recognized position in the world without which a man has no leverage. When those were attained, I began to look farther to the utility of the human race. He paused as he rounded his period, and Ransom nodded to him to proceed because he doesn't like to be interrupted. The utility of the human race, continued Weston, in the long run depends rigidly on the possible of interplanetary and even intersidereal travel. That problem I solved. The key of human destiny was placed in my hands. It would be unnecessary and painful to us both to remind you how it was wrenched from me in Malacandra by a member of a hostile intelligent species whose existence I admit I had not anticipated. Um, not hostile exactly, said Ransom, but go on. Anyway, he goes on. And he then has a breakdown. We find out what's happened to Weston in his way. He has a mental breakdown and he listens to, he hears what Ransom had said to him, the humanist ideal. And he recognizes that there was something there that 
he had not recognized before and now he does recognize it. And what does that mean? I mean, all, that, all my life I've been making a wholly unscientific dichotomy or antithesis between man and nature. Had conceived myself fighting for man against his non-human environment. During my illness, I plunged into biology and hitherto into what might be called biological philosophy. Hitherto, as a phys physicist, I've been content to regard life as a subject outside my scope. It's capitalized here in the text. The conflicting views of those who draw a sharp line between organic and the inorganic, and those who held that what we call life was inherent in matter from the very beginning had not interest me, interested me, now it did. I saw almost at once that I could admit no break, no discontinuity in the unfolding of the cosmic process. So again, creative evolution. I became a convinced believer in emergent evolution. There's his phrase. All is one. The stuff of mind, the very unconsciously purpose of dynamism is present from the very beginning. So he is an inclusivist. That's what pantheism, he's an inclusivist. Everything is included, there's nothing false, everything's true. We need to see the unity in all things. True of the Romantics as well. True of Hinduism. All manifestations of uh, the life force, the good in, in emergent evolution. So <laughs> here he paused, Ransom had heard this sort of thing pretty often before and wondered when his companion was coming to the point. The, and here's the point, with an even deeper solemnity of, for, of tone, the majestic spectacle of this blind, inarticulate purposiveness thrusting its way upward and ever upward in an endless unity of differentiated achievements towards an ever increasing complexity of organization, towards spontaneity and spirituality swept away all my old conception of a duty to man as such. Man in himself is nothing. The forward movement of life, the growing spirituality, is everything. So there you have it in a nutshell. What does this mean? Man is now amongst the things that can be sacrificed. That's what it means. Because everything is one, and yet the real top of the chain is not even man. We're moving beyond man. Now we get into Nazism, quite frankly. The master race of Adolf Hitler is just a prelude to a higher uh, type of life, a higher form of life. And if they don't fulfill their vocation according to Nazi ideology, um, then they deserve to die. So Hitler drives them on at the same time hates the people that he's driving on. Really interesting, read his works on this. There's a, a loathing towards the Germans even while he, while he massacres other races, he also doesn't like, he's not happy with the Germans either because they won't obey orders and wipe, them, wipe the others out. This is their high calling. It's demonic. Yes? And so to that point, I think with, with the sciences, the methodology by which they see transcendence is through um, development of technology, yes. different things like that. Yes. In this case, is the methodology something akin to like meditation? Like what is it? That it could like be. So that would be the soft form of it. But the, but the applied form of it is to uh, take human life as it exists and to break it up to reconstitute, to reconstruct it. Um, but most of all, to move beyond the givenness of, of created life. Because that's just, that's a step in the ladder which we need to put behind us. And so this is my, this is my explanation for things like transgenderism and gender identity. It's to take the created order as we can perceive it and to move on to new categories. It's not actually about liberating people who feel like they're trapped in another person's body. It's to move to a different category which defies a natural order and natural law. It's a higher form of spiritual life. Because again, they'll talk about carbon footprints, etc., and that threatening the rest of the created order. Well, why should we privilege human nature when actually the human beings are the only things that are destructive of the order as it is, we can reduce the carbon footprints significantly. And that includes, to my mind, killing, which we're seeing in our own day. 
It's just part of the same logic, if you can call it that. But, it is, but, he, but he puts it right here. Man is himself nothing. The forward movement of life, the growing spirituality is everything. Well, a, light, a, a notion of life that regards man as nothing is a very different spirituality than <laughs> a form of life that uh, ra rises from the dead. Right? So again, in the speaking of the scientist here, he's speaking now not really so much of, of, a, of a traditional scientific view, but more of the Bergsonian, the spiritual. And I, I note with some alarm, more and more people talking about themselves as spiritual but not religious. Very common, you know. And uh, only chaos ensues there. Reason does not hold. There's no purchase on this because there's a fanaticism about the group that doesn't admit to argumentation or being contradicted. They know there's a fervor uh, to it. And, and Ransom's response is exactly that. I don't know much about what people call the religious view of life, said Ransom, wrinkling his brow. You see, I'm a Christian, and what we mean by the Holy Ghost is not a blind, inarticulate purposiveness. At which point, Weston replies that Ransom's own view of religion is too restrictive and too exclusive, and he needs to open up a little bit. <laughs> open himself up. And he says that we're actually talking about exactly the same thing. Ransom begs to, dis begs to differ. And that then goes on to Wesson, if you permit me to say so, is one of the real weaknesses of organized religion, that adherence to formulae, that failure to recognize one's own friends. God is a spirit, Ransom. Get hold of that. You're familiar with that already. Stick to it. God is a spirit. Well, of course. But what then? What then? Why? Spirit, mind, freedom spontaneity that's what i'm talking about nobody doesn't talk about rationality spontaneity is the action uh that has nothing to do with any sense of purposiveness it's just you do it on the on a whim no reason for it whatsoever it's a, it's a the principle of chaos randomness not order not reason pure spirit the goal ransom the goal, think of it, pure spirit, the final vortex of self-thinking, self-originating activity. Final, you mean it doesn't yet exist? Ah, that's bothering you. So, talks about in terms of life, and at that point, Weston speaks in a hushed voice, and yes, he's been hearing spirits. And now that it gets quite eerie. Quite eerie. That's what none of them understand. It was such a gangster's or a schoolboy's whisper and so unlike his usual oratund lecturing saw that Ransom for a moment felt a sensation almost of disgust. Yes, said Weston, I couldn't have believed myself till recently. Not a person, of course. Anthropomorphism is one of the childish diseases of popular religion. But the opposite extreme of excessive abstraction is perhaps in the aggregate proved more disastrous. Call it a force, a great inscrutable force pouring up into us from the dark bases of being, a force that can choose its instruments. Now here, he's going to lay hold of another work I want to point you to, uh, that of Joseph Campbell. Have you, have you heard of Joseph Campbell? Hero of a Thousand Faces. And this is a theory of mythology which probably begins with... Uh, the, uh, uh, the Golden Bough, uh, which I often mention in, in first year. Uh, the Golden Bough uh, by, gosh, what's his name now? Uh, forgotten, totally forgotten. It'll come to me. Um, but it, it suggests that the mythological structure of the archetypal hero is found in every myth popularized in our day by Jordan Peterson. Hero of a Thousand Faces, it's all the same myth. All the spirits are saying effectively the same thing. The claim of exclusivity in one religion is dogmatic, unprovable, exclusive, etc. Sir James Fraser, yes it is. Yeah. 
It's a massive tome, and it's a, it's a quasi-scientific one. It's anthropological, and he notes the, the differing types of spirituality, and he, go, he looks at literally every tribe and nation as far as it's an extraordinary work. Very influential in its day. Uh, Campbell is talking more now not about these uh, observations that Fraser talks about. He's talking about the structure of myth and the story of a journey of an archetypal hero that he finds across world myths. Very influ influential on George Lucas, by the way, in Star Wars. And not without reason, the Force plays a, a big role in the Star Wars trilogy. And then he, as I say, does this terrible thing and reduces it to a materialist cause, which just destroys the whole story. But never mind. Let me not get back to that. So there's a monomyth. There's a single myth that is being told in different forms. And it's a variation on uh, the inclusivism that you get uh, the, you know, the story of the, the, the five blind men and the elephant, and one grabs a, 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 a tusk and the other grabs a leg and the other grabs a trunk, and, the other, and they all think that this is what God is like. He's, he's you know, he's firm and, and solid and whatever, and one, oh no, he, it's not firm, it's squishy and hairy, and the other, oh no, it's smooth and whatever, it depends. But all of the blind men only see one aspect of the monomyth. So it's a variation on that view, that all the myths are effectively saying the same thing, but they're only getting one side of it. But there's a unity to them. That is Campbell's explanation of this, and it's also the view of this scientist here. And, it's, and Ransom disagrees with it profoundly. It says that not all spirits are the Holy Spirit. Not all forces are. And then he says, guided, he said, chosen. Guided, I've become conscious that I'm a man set apart. Why did I do physics? Why did I discover the Western rays? Why did I go to Malacandra? It, the force, has pushed me on all the time. I'm being guided. I know now that I am the greatest scientist the world has yet produced. I've been made so for a purpose. It is through me that spirit itself is at this moment pushing on to its goal. Look here, said Ransom. One wants to be careful about this sort of thing. There are spirits and spirits, you know. Huh? Said Weston, what are you talking about? I mean, a thing might be a spirit and not good for you. But I thought you agreed that spirit was the good. The end of the whole process. Now note that he leans in the direction then of the uh, heresy, the ancient heresy of Gnosticism. Privileging the spirit over the material. Material is bad, needs to be dispensed with, move beyond it. The spirit in us is good. We will become spiritual, not embodied. The importance in the incarnation is not only that Jesus took on a human body, but he was also raised bodily. He died bodily, he was raised bodily. He was bodily visible. You could, he could eat afterwards. You could put your fingers in his side. There was, a, there was a resurrection body. Very important in Christian theology. It totally undermines Gnosticism as, as a worldview. Weston advances it here afresh. And he says, there's nothing specifically f uh, fine about being a spirit. The devil is a spirit. And of course, then uh, he's going to dispute that, that there is such a thing and say that effectively they're one and the same thing. And at this point, uh, a little bit on, he invites he says, is the pure spirit alive? And he says, oh, yes, it is. Because I know it. Because he's working through me. And he invites the spirit into him. And, uh, at this, and, and uh, there's a debate over morality. And uh, this is, so this is it. Uh, Weston speaking. Here's the fundamental paradox. The thing we are reaching forward to is what you would call God. The reaching forward, the dynamism, is what people like you always call the devil. The ones that means to the same end. The people like me who do the reaching forward are always martyrs. You revile us and by us come to your goal. Does that mean, in plainer language, that the things the force wants you to do are what ordinary people call diabolical? My dear Ransom, I wish you would not keep relapsing onto the popular level. The two things are only moments in the single unique reality. The world leaps forward through great men and greatness always transcends 
mere moralism. It's beyond good and evil. Right? Quoting Nietzsche. Not, that's me quoting Nietzsche, not him. No mention of that. But it's beyond those things. It's the Ubermensch. He, he's kicking away humanity. He's standing above that. When the leap has been made, our diabolism, as you would call it, becomes the morality of the new, next stage. But while we are making it, we are called criminals, heretics, blasphemers. How far does it go? Would you still obey the life force if you found it prompting you to murder me? Yes. <laughs> or to sell England to the Germans? Yes. Or to print lies as serious research in a scientific periodical? Yes. God help you, said Ransom. You are still wedded to your conventionality, still dealing in abstractions. Can you not even conceive a total commitment, a commitment to something which utterly overrides all petty ethical pigeonholes? He grasped at a straw. Wait, Weston, that may be the point of contact. You say it's a total commitment. That is, you're giving up yourself. You're not out for your own advantage. No, wait for a second, half a second. This is the point of contact between your morality and mine. We both acknowledge a good outside of ourselves, a higher purpose, right? Interrupted. Idiot, said Weston. His voice was almost a howl, and he had risen to his feet. Idiot! He repeated, can you understand nothing? Will you always try to press everything back into the miserable framework of your old jargon about self and self-sacrifice? That's the old accursed dualism. In another form, there is no possible distinction in concrete thought between me and the universe. Insofar as I am the conductor of the central forward pressure of the universe, I am it. Do you see, you timid, scruple-mongering fool, I am the universe. I, Weston, am your god and your devil. I call that force into me completely. Then horrible things began happening. A spasm like that, preceding a deadly vomit, twisted his face out of recognition. As it passed for one second, something like the old Weston reappeared, the old Weston staring with eyes of horror and howling, ransom, ransom, for Christ's sake, don't let them. And instantly his whole body spun around as if he'd been hit by a revolver bullet and he fell to the earth, etc. And uh, anyway, so something like an epileptic fit, but he has called into himself the spirit that's been pushing him onwards. And at that point, he becomes what is called the unman. It's extraordinary. So the, the physical manifestation of Weston is still there. The body is there, but he's been possessed now. And uh, we then get what ensues, the purpose of bringing Weston there is to begin the temptation, and it is the devil. It's no longer the scientist, but the scientist has moved his science to the point where it now embraces uh, dark spiritual affairs. In the name of advancing the good, it collapses the distinction between good and evil, uh, even willing to ignore all moral considerations. So it's a, it's a sharp critique of modern science which he will uh, expand upon in The Abolition of Man. We're going to look at that. We'll look at chapter 3 in particular, where he, he talks about precisely that. Any questions before I, I go on? Because I have uh, nowhere near moved on as much as I would like to. Extraordinary, though. Yeah, I, I wanted you to get the thrust of it, and, because it's very important. And note that it, how connected it is with Campbell's view of mythology. Again, notice how it bears alarming um, comparison to the views being espoused by Dr. Peterson. Alarming. Not making any accusations. I'm saying there's a lack of discernment in this. All of this. Uh, this reading. And, and there is something to be said for comparative mythology. Lewis himself sees, remember, myths do contain a, a, a part of the truth here and they point to the true myth. But that's the point, there is a true myth. And it's not the monomyth of, of uh, Joseph Campbell, it's that of Christianity. That's the true myth. The others have an aspect of that, but not the whole picture, this one does. The others are just stories, if you will. Whereas here, they're, they're, the, all the stories together, the composite of the whole, that's the monomyth. And it promotes spirituality at the expense of religious views, and again, it sacrifices reason in the process as well. There's no reasoning here. He, he will not allow himself to be argued with because he's, he's, a, he's a zealot. Okay, well, no questions. I will move on then. Um, 
the uh, in 103 the man unman tempts the green lady and uh, he awakes that is ransom in the dark and he hears a voice and it is Weston and the lady and the lady says this I'm wondering said the woman's voice whether all the people of your world have the habit of talking about the same thing more than once <laughs> I have said already that we are forbidden to dwell on the fixed land. Why do you not either talk of something else or stop talking? Because this forbidding is such a strange one, said the man's voice, and so unlike the ways of Maleldil in my world, and he has not forbidden you to think about dwelling on the fixed land. That would be a strange thing to think about what will never happen. Nay, in our world we do it all the time. We put words together to mean things that have never happened and places that never were. Beautiful words, well put together. And then tell them to one another. We call it stories or poetry. In that old world you spoke of, Malachander, they did the same. It's for mirth and wonder and wisdom. What is the wisdom in it? Because the world is made up not only of what is, but of what might be. Mal Eldil knows both and wants us to know both. This is more than I ever thought of. The other, the piebald one, has already told me things which made me feel like a tree whose branches were growing wider and wider apart. But this goes beyond all. Stepping out of what is into what might be and talking and making things out there alongside the world? I will ask the king what he thinks of it. You see, that's what you always come back to if only you had not parted from the king and whatever. Okay. And so he, she, he, what he tries to do, the strategy is to get her to think, first of all, about the mere possibility of it. And that act of imagination is the, is the, beach, if, the beachhead, if you will, onto the fixed land. Just imagine it, because this is leading her will in a direction that she would never entertain if it were just say, Step, stay on the fixed land, no chance of that. But imagine that, and what would become of that? And, and there's a discussion about Mal Elil's purposes here in uh, bringing her to a greater glory. So he created her good, but she is learning. She's becoming less young. This is already a principle of the created order. You become something that you were not before. You learn new things. Here's one way you can do that. And it, he, he appeals to her imagination. So you thought you would always learn things from the king, but now Malaldil has sent you other men whom it had never entered your mind to think of, and they have told you things the king himself could not know. I begin to see why the king and I were parted at this time. This is a strange and great good he intended for me. And if you refused to learn things from me and kept on saying you'd wait and ask the king, would that not be like turning away from the fruit you had found to the fruit you had expected? These are deep questions, stranger. Mal Eldil is not putting much into my mind about them. Do you not see why? No. Since Piebald and I have come to your world, we have put many things into your mind which Mal Eldil has not. Do you not see that he's letting go of your hand a little? How could he? He's wherever we go. But she's saying he, he's letting you go your own way. Here's the suggestion, okay? What is he doing? He's making you a full woman. For up till now, you were only half made, like the beasts who do nothing of themselves. This time, when you meet the king again, it is you who will have things to tell him. It is you who will be older than he and who will make him older. Mal Elder would not make a thing like that happen. It would be like a fruit with no taste. He's appealing to the Satan, uh, Milton's Paradise Lost, where Eve, after she eats the fruit, imagines that she'll be more equal <laughs> with Adam. By eating the fruit, she'll be more equal. I don't even know what the phrase means. It's a contradiction, right? You're either equal or you're not equal, but you can be more equal. A and what is meant by that is superior. But this is, and, and her response, the idea of becoming superior to a being that she is, in some sense, inferior, would deprive a fruit of its taste. Why would I want to do that? And th therefore, it would not be, and then, but he says in response, but it would have a taste for him. 
Do you think the king must sometimes be tired of being the older? Would he not love you more if you were wiser than he? Is this what you call poetry? Or do you mean it really is? I mean a thing that really is, but how could anyone love anything more? It's like saying a thing could be bigger than itself. I only meant you could become more like the woman of my world. What are they like? Oh, of great spirit, etc., etc. And he again uh, pushes the idea of uh, greatness into her head. You can become greater. He will love you more. You'll be more like the figures of this world. Her response is, uh, to this is humility. How wonderful is Maleldil and his ways? How much greater than he? I will worship him. This is it. And there is uh, the response here, 107, the whole darkness about him rang with victory. Temptation, set aside. She is not interested in being more than she is. She wants to worship God. So done. And the uh, first salvo in the war uh, is over. Uh, the second is on 112. Uh, I'll, I'll move over this quickly. He wants to propose the arts as a detachment from God and propose human creativity, not as a repetition of what God has done and a sort of re, what, what Tolkien calls sub-creation, but rather creation ex nihilo as, as the proposal. And Ransom comes into the mix and intercedes. So now for the first time, the two men square off and uh, he uses logic to uh, in in the fray here. Um, let me go to 118. Lady, so he's he's hearing her being tempted by Weston or the unman, and he comes into her aid. Lady said, "Ransom, if I speak, will you hear me?" Gladly, piebald. This man has said that the law against living on the fixed island is different from the other laws because it is not the same for all worlds, and because we cannot see the goodness in it. And so far he says, well. But then he says that it is thus different in order that you may disobey it. But there might be another reason. Say it, piebald. I think he made one law of that kind in order that there might be obedience. In all these other matters, what you call obeying him is but doing what seems good in your own eyes also. Is love content with that? You do them indeed because they are his will, but not only because they are his will. Where can you taste the joy of obeying unless he bids you do something for which his bidding is the only reason? When we spoke last, you said, if you told the beasts to walk on their heads, they would delight to do so. So I know that you understand well what I am saying. Oh, brave piebald, said the great green lady. This is the best you have ever said. This makes me older far, yet it does not feel like the oldness this other is giving me. Oh, how well I see it. We cannot walk out of Maleldil's will, but he has given us a way to walk out of, our, out of our will. And there could be no such way except a command like this. Out of our own will. It is like passing through the roof, world's roof into deep heaven. All beyond is love himself. I knew there was joy in looking upon the fixed island and laying down all thought of ever living there, but I did not till now understand her face was radiant as she spoke, but then a shade of bewilderment crossed it. Piebald, she said, if you are so young, as this other says, how do you know these things? He says, I am young, but I say not. The voice of Weston's face spoke suddenly. Isn't that chilling? The voice of Weston's face not Weston, the voice of his face, spoke suddenly and it was louder and deeper than before and less like Weston's voice. I am older than he, it said, and he dare not deny it. Before the mothers of the mothers of his mother were conceived, I was already older than he could reckon. I have been with Mal Eldil in deep heaven where he never came and heard the eternal counsels. And in the order of creation, I am greater than he and before me, he is of no account. Is it not so? The corpse-like face did not even now turn towards him, but the speaker and the lady both seemed to wait for Ransom to reply. The falsehood which sprang to his mind died on his lips. 
in that air, even when truth seemed fatal, only truth would serve. Licking his lips and choking down a feeling of nausea, he answered, in our world, to be older is not always to be wiser. Look at him, said Weston's body to the lady. Consider how white his cheeks have turned and how his forehead is wet. You've not seen such things before. You will see them more often hereafter. It is what happens. It is the beginning of what happens to little creatures when they set themselves against great ones. Threat. An exquisite thrill of fear traveled along Ransom's spine. What saved him was the face of the lady. Untouched by the evil so close to her, removed as it were ten years' journey deep within the region of her own innocence, and by that innocence at once, protected and so endangered, she looked up at the standing death above her, puzzled indeed, but not beyond the bounds of cheerful curiosity, and said, but he was right, stranger. About this forbidding, it is you who need to be made older. Can you not see? I have always seen the whole whereof he sees but the half. It is most true that Meleldal has given you a way of walking out of your own will, but out of your deepest will. And what is that? Your deepest will at present is to obey him, to be always as you are now, only his beast or his very young child. The way out of that is hard. It was made hard that only the very great the very wise, the very courageous should dare to walk in it, to go on and out of this smallness in which you now live through the dark wave of his forbidding into the real life, deep life, with all its joy and splendor and hardness. Listen, lady, said Ransom, there is something he's not telling you. All this that we are now talking has been talked before. The thing he wants you to try has been tried before. And then he talks about the fall and the, the evil that came out of it. He has hidden half of what happened, said Weston's corpse-like mouth. Hardness came out of it, but also splendor. They made with their own hands mountains higher than your fixed island. They made for themselves floating islands greater than yours, which they could move at will through the ocean faster than any bird can fly. Because there was not always food enough, a woman could give the only fruit to her child or her husband and eat death instead could give them all, as you and your little narrow life of playing and kissing and riding fishes have never done, nor shall do till you break the commandment, because knowledge was harder to find these, those few who found it became more beautiful and excelled their fellows as you excel the beasts, etc. The lady says, I'll go to sleep, and Unman says, not yet. There is more. He's not told you that it was this breaking of the commandment which brought Mal Eldil to our world, and because of which he was made man. He dare not deny it. Do you say this, piebald? asked the lady. Ransom was sitting with his fingers locked so tightly that his knuckles were white. The unfairness of it all was wounding him like barbed wire. Unfair, unfair. How could Mal Eldil expect him to fight against this, to fight with every weapon taken from him? forbidden to lie, and yet brought to places where truth seemed fatal. It was unfair. Do you say this, piebald, said the lady a second time. The spell was broken. I tell you what I say, said Ransom. The, of course good came of it. Is Mal Eldil a beast that it, he, we can stop his path, or a leaf that we can twist his shape? Whatever you do, he will make good of it but not the good he had prepared for you if you had obeyed him. That is lost forever. The first king and first mother of our world did the forbidden thing, and he brought good of it in the end. But what they did was not good, and what they lost we had not seen. And there were some to whom no good came, nor ever will come. He turned to the body of Weston. You, he said, tell her all. What good came to you? Do you rejoice that Malaldil became a man? Tell her of your joys and of what profit you had when you made Malaldil and death acquainted. And now the beast rears back its head and howls. A, a man-aged course, the bogey, the unman. And then it just keeps 
So there's a, a fight, and then he just wears him down. He keeps saying, ransom. Ran he won't let ransom sleep. And so the, it's, a, it's a battle of attrition. So he tries the logic. He defeats them in, in the argument in the end. Yes, he did become a man. What happened when you acquainted death in man? What happened then? We all know. He, was, he destroyed the devil's work. He, he rose from the dead, he, right? He knows this, and he howls at it. So now he's trying a different way, and, and, and the unman is described like a schoolboy who's just sort of pestering him. Pick, pick, pick. So it's not, it's not the sort of, it's the low-grade bullying of a person that is not allowed to sleep by a being that doesn't need to sleep, and he knows he can't win. So he's not going to have a battle of wits with him. He already knows that he's lost that fight. He can't out-argue him. Um, but he can keep nagging at him. And he, as he does this, he keeps speaking to the lady, and the lady starts showing signs of distress in her face because she's contemplating. He gets her to, to wear a feather, uh, feathers from the birds she plucks, and she sees herself in the water, and she thinks she's beautiful. She's naked and beautiful, of course. Now she's dressed like the women of our world, and she rather fancies it. And so she, he's, she starts imagining herself in this fictional fashion, and in the end, he realizes uh, that the combat that he's come to undertake is not of the variety that he expected, namely of spiritual warfare, as in logic, but rather a physical combat. And of course, this terrifies him, the very thought of it. Um, and the idea of a fall, uh, he discusses this on 143, 144, he makes a uh, triple distinction uh, uh, between truth uh, from myth and of both from fact. These, this threefold distinction is a terrestrial distinction. No, doesn't hold true in this world. By the way, Lewis here is not talking about, I said this last time, physical fighting as a way of fighting spiritual warfare in our world. He's talking about it in a different condition. But that distinction, which we accept here, doesn't hold true there. The physical fight the mythological fight, the spiritual fight, they're all one and the same. And so he realizes there's no way he can stop a spiritual being who doesn't have to sleep except through physical means. And he is terrified at the very thought of it. His own intuition at 120, 145 had been, not, been that no temptation must occur, but this can't go on. This can't go on. And something has to, has to be done. And then I'm going to go to 147. He knows what he has to do now. He knows what he has to do. He has to kill the unman. And he's terrified at the thought of it. Terrible follies came into his mind. He, could, he, could, he would fail to obey the boys, but it would be all right because he would repent later on when he was back on earth. He would lose his nerve as St. Peter had done and be like St. Peter forgiven. Intellectually, of course, he knew the answer to these temptations perfectly well, but he was at one of those moments when all the utterance of intellect sound like twice told ta tales. Then some crosswind of the mind changed his mood. Perhaps he would fight and win. Perhaps not even be badly mauled. But no faintest hint of a guarantee in that direction came to him from the darkness. The future was black as the night itself. It is not for nothing that you are named Ransom said the voice. And he knew that this was no fancy of his own. He knew that it for a very curious reason because he had known for many years that his surname was derived not from Ransom but from Ranulf's son. It would never have occurred to him thus to associate the two words. T to connect the name Ransom with the act of ransoming would have been for him a mere pun. But even his voluble self, that is his willful self, the one that doesn't want to obey, did not now dare to suggest that the voice was making a play upon words. All in a moment of time he perceived what, that what was to human philologists a mere accidental resemblance of two sounds was in truth no accident. So he is here to, be, to lay down his life if need be. And then the voice, next page on, my name also is Ransom, said the voice. It was some time before the purport of this saying dawned upon him. He whom the other worlds call Mel Eldil was the world's ransom. 
his own ransom well he knew but to what purpose was it said now before the answer came to him he felt its insufferable approach and held out his arms before him as if he could keep from it forcing open the door of his mind but it came so that was the real issue if he now failed this world also would hereafter be redeemed if he were not the ransom another would be yet nothing was ever repeated not a second crucifixion perhaps who knows not even a second incarnation some act of even more appalling love some glory of yet deeper humility for he had seen already how the pattern grows and how from each world it sprouts into the next through some other dimension the small external evil which satan had done in malacandra was only as a line the deeper evil he had done in earth was as a square if venus fell her evil would be a cube her redemption beyond conceiving yet redeemed she would be he had long known that great issues hung on his choice but as he now realized the true width of the frightful freedom that was being put into his hands a width to which all merely spatial infinity seemed narrow he felt like a man brought out under naked heaven on the edge of a precipice precipice into the teeth of a wind that came howling from the pole he had pictured himself till now standing before the Lord like Peter but it was worse he sat before him like Pilate it lay with him to save or to spill his hands had been reddened as all men have been in the slaying before the foundation of the world. Quoting scripture, the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. Now, if he chose, he could dip them again in the same blood. Mercy, he groaned, and then, Lord, why me? But there was no answer. And then he has a knowledge about this time tomorrow you will have done the impossible. And he is just determined. So there's, a, there, there's, no, there's an internal debate and a battle which he first experienced at the outset of the book going forward a sense of evil spirits trying to keep him from this and at the same time being directed onwards he has to make his choice and here is the evolution evolution the development of the character of El elwin ransom he becomes a different character in the process of choosing to obey and is fit for purpose then now now this is a science fiction novel, but Lewis is trying to make us aware of the same battle happening in this world with our choices, thinking that they are actually of significance. That's what he's trying to demonstrate here. He'll do the same thing in Miracles. He'll do the same thing in Screw Tape. He'll do the same thing in uh, The Great Divorce. Talk about these temptations to not obey. And yet here, uh, the, the character of ransom will grow because precisely because he does obey same message as milton and he will therein have a paradise within happier far but that i'll, I'll move on with that i'll probably finish it off with it for now because i think i'm at the end of the time i'll say a few more words about this at the end then we'll move to the next section any 